it wasn't long after his speech toward, to the evangelicals that Tony Palmer posted this on his Facebook wall. I'm on my way to Rome for two highly important meetings. The Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity and B. Pope Francis. We're discussing the variety and breadth of all our feedback from the publication of Pope Francis's video. And then he said there were 800,000 hits on that particular video. So there must be millions by now. And then on the 4th of the 4th, he said, Dear friends, thank you for all your prayers and kind comments. Our meetings in Rome were highly fruitful. We spent more than three hours with the Pontifical Office for the Promotion of Christian Unity, which included lunch. And then our afternoon with Pope Francis was like being at home with the wise and gracious Father. He gave me the green light to take the next step. The miracle of unity is happening. And then in June 2014, the evangelicals went to meet with the papacy. And Tony Palmer was still alive. And just thereafter, he suffered that tragic motorcycle accident. Televangelists, including Kenneth Copeland and James Robinson, met with the Pope Francis, resulting in the first ever papal high five. This comes from www.charismanews.com. And they state, two prominent Fort Worth-based Christian ministers led a delegation of evangelical Christian leaders to Rome to meet privately with Pope Francis. James and Betty Robertson, co-hosts of Life Today's television program and Kenneth Copeland, co-host of Believer's Voice of Victory, met the Roman pontiff at the Vatican on Tuesday. The meeting lasted almost three hours and included a private luncheon with Pope Francis. Mr. Robertson told the Fort Worth Star-Telegram this meeting was a miracle. This is something God has done. God wants his arms around the world. He wants Christians to put his arms around the world by working together. Aware that the meeting with the Pope will be troublesome amongst staunch Protestants, Mr. Robertson said he and others visiting, other ev visiting evangelical Christian leaders talked about diversity and their belief that Roman Catholics and Protestants could work together without compromising their beliefs. The world is suffering, said Robinson. We as Christians have too much love to share without fighting one another. Isn't that interesting? And then, Pope Francis, at a rally in the stadium before the Roman Catholic Charismatics, invites them to Vatican 2017. Francis also said, Catholic Charismatics have a special role to play in healing divisions amongst Christians by exercising spiritual ecumenism. Fascinating term. Spiritual ecumenism. Or praying with members of other Christian churches and communities who share a belief in Jesus as Lord. And here he is at the rally. And finally, Pope Francis invited the crowd, which included charismatics from 55 countries, to come to St. Peter's Square for Pentecost in 2017 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the movement. The Catholic Charismatic Movement began during a retreat in 1967 with students and staff from the Kesner University in Pittsburgh. So here you have a jubilee feast. And he says, 2017... Let's get together. And they're expecting a spiritual ecumenism. He said, quote, I expect all of you charismatics from around the world to celebrate your great jubilee with the Pope at Pentecost 2017 in St. Peter's Square. Now, 2017 is also 
a jubilee for the Protestant world because in 2017 they celebrate their 500th year, which is divisible by 50. So they have a jubilee. It's a jubilee of jubilees. And they said that they want to bury the hatchet, remember? And apologize for the division of the church. Rabbi Judah ben Samuel, in the year 1217, gave a prophecy of the beginning of the end time, which would begin in the year 2017. 1217, he prophesied that the Ottoman Turks would rule over the holy city of Jerusalem for eight jubilees, a period of 400 years. This was fulfilled in the year 1517, when the Ottoman Turks seized control of the city of Jerusalem, ending in the year 1917, exactly 400 years. So the Jews are expecting a mega jubilee in 2017. He then prophesied a ninth jubilee of 50 years in which Jerusalem would be a no man's land, fulfilled during the British mandate of 1917 to 1967, a period of 50 years where Jerusalem belonged to no nation and was called a no man's land. And then of course, there was the Six-Day War. And that took place when? 1967. Well, this is what Wikipedia tells us, and those of us who are, are old enough will remember the Six-Day War in 1967. Now add 50 years to that, and what do you get? 2017. So everybody is Jubilee jubilant. Everybody is Jubilee jubilant. Now, in 2017, Protestants have issued this joint declaration with Rome that they want to bury the hatchet and apologize for the separation of the church. 2017, the Charismatics will celebrate their jubilee. The Pope says, come to, Jerus uh, come to the Vatican. We'll celebrate it together. And the Jews are celebrating their kingdom. It seems to be a great celebration. Hebrews 11, 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Because he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Jesuit theology says, I think, therefore I am. The only reality is me, I can't see God, so I must rely upon my own reality to decide what is good and what is wrong. So I am a, a rule unto myself. The exact opposite of faith. If faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, then it must be word-based faith. Jesus said that he loves you and that he died for you and that you accept by faith. Whereas if you are in the charismatic union, then experiential religion is what you are seeking. You are seeking the evidence of God's presence in you here and now. Then it's not evidence of things not seen, but things of literally seen. If you're waiting for gold dust to fall from the sky, if you're waiting for a manifestation like being slain in the spirit, if you're waiting for a proof demonstration then it's not faith, but reality. And if it's not faith, then it's impossible to please him. Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For what, who, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is a serious issue. 
Now, Tony Palmer said that the charismatic union or the charismatic movement is the glue that glues Christianity together. Forget about the doctrines, he'll sort them out upstairs. Didn't he say that? Now, I want to know the nature of the glue and I want to understand whether this can be from God or whether it is not from God. Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, he who has made himself master of the principles and texts of the word runs little risk of committing errors. A theologian should be thoroughly in possession of the basis and source, source of faith, that is to say the Holy Scriptures. Armed with this knowledge, it was that I confounded and silenced all my adversaries, for they seek not to fathom and understand the Scriptures. They run them over negligently and drowsily, they speak, they write, they teach according to the suggestions of their heedless imaginations. My counsel is that we draw water from the true source and fountain, that is, that we diligently search the scriptures, Martin Luther in Table Talk. Now what the third person is, the holy evangelist St. John teaches, where he says, but when the comforter is come, which I will send unto you, from the Father, the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Here Christ speaks not only of the office and work of the Holy Ghost, but also of his substance and faith. He goes out or proceeds from the Father, that is, he's going out or his proceeding is without all beginning and everlasting. Therefore the Holy Prophet Joel gives him the name and calls him the Spirit of the Lord. This is Martin Luther. I'm just giving a little bit of reformed thinking. He continues. The Son suffers himself to be given to the world and to be lifted up on the cross as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. To this work comes afterwards the third person, the Holy Ghost, who kindles faith in the heart through the word and so regenerates us and makes us the children of God. I, I see nothing to apologize for in these statements. We ought not to criticize, explain, or judge the scriptures by our mere reason, but diligently with prayer meditate thereon and seek their meaning. The devil and temptations also afford us occasion to learn and understand the scriptures by experience and practice. Without these, we should never understand them, however diligently we read and listen to them. The Holy Ghost must here be our only master and tutor, and let youth have no shame to learn of that preceptor. When I find myself assailed by temptation, I forthwith lay hold of some text of the Bible, which Jesus extends to me, as this, that he died for me, whence I derive infinite comfort. I don't need to see it. I don't need to touch it. I don't need to experience it. It says so. Therefore, it is so. That's faith. That's faith. We read in Acts of the Apostles, the nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a mere human construction on them. But the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human understanding. Silence is golden. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit and the work and how he is or what he is, the, we know what he has to do. Leave it at that. Leave it at that. The office of the Holy Spirit is distinctly specified in the words of Christ. When he come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. If the sinner responds to the quickening influence of the Spirit, he will be brought to repentance and aroused to the importance of obeying the divine requirements. To the repentant sinner, hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the Holy Spirit reveals the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He will receive of mine and shall show it unto you. 
Christ said, He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 16, 14, 14, 26. So this is the office of the Holy Spirit. We are told what he will do. And that should suffice. It is not a conclusive evidence that a man is a Christian because he manifests spiritual ecstasy under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness is not rapture. It is an entire surrender of the will to God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial, in darkness, as well as in light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestionable confidence and resting in His love. So it's walking by faith and not by sight. I don't have to go to a special meeting to experience a euphoric manifestation in order to know that God is concerned about my well-being. He died for me on the cross. He's concerned by faith, accepted. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the comforter, the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that in his work of guiding men into all truth, he shall not speak of himself. And these are very important concepts. John 14, 16. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What's the second one? Thy word is truth. The third one, all thy commandments are truth. Three definitions, that's all in the Bible. So if he's the spirit of truth, he must lead to Christ, he must lead to the word, and he must lead to obedience. Otherwise, he's not the spirit of truth, he's the spirit of the lie. Simple. And aren't we told to test the spirits? And this spirit of truth the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now here's a very, very important point. Who doesn't know him? The world doesn't know him. Who does know him? God's people know him. I want you to remember that. File that in your filing cabinet. It's the world that doesn't know the Holy Spirit. But God's people know the Holy Spirit. How do they know him? Because he's led them to Christ, to his word and to his law. That's how they know the Holy Spirit. Those three criteria. If he's the spirit of truth, he leads you to Christ, he leads you to the word, and he leads you to the law. That's it. And the world doesn't know him. I will not leave you comfortless. Jesus speaking. I will come to you. But Jesus says it's expedient that I go away so that the comforter may come. So how does Christ continue to communicate with his children? Through the Holy Spirit. So who is the Holy Spirit in this context? Spirit of Christ. And if God, the Father, and Jesus Christ are one and the same, can we say it's the Spirit of God? But exactly what He is and what He looks like and whether I will, whatever. The Bible says nothing about it. So accept it for what it is. So let's have a look again in John chapter 16. However, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. All truth, and we've identified what truth is. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak. Whatever he shall hear, that must be God the Father, God the Son, right? And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify... Jesus, because this is Jesus speaking. 
for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. So whose words will the Spirit speak? The words of Jesus. And this is all very important. This is very important. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeds from the Father, he shall testify of me. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. Christ says, speaking of the Comforter, he shall not speak of himself, he shall testify of me, he shall glorify me. How little has Christ been preached? The laborers have presented theories, plenty of them, but little of Christ and his love. As the Savior came to glorify the Father by the demonstration of, the lo of his love, so the Spirit came to glorify Christ by revealing to the world the riches of his love and grace. Is that in harmony with Scripture? If the Holy Spirit dwells in us, our work will testify to the fact we shall lift up Jesus. Not one can afford to be silent now. The burden of the work is to present Christ to the world. All who venture to have their own way, who do not join the angels who are sent from heaven with a message to fill the whole earth with its glory, will be passed by. The work will go forward to victory without them, and they will have no part in its triumph. So when we preach the three angels' messages, including the warning against the mark of the beast, it means that you must accept by faith the righteousness of Christ which will be manifest in good works, including keeping the commandments of God, and the Sabbath will be the pivotal relationship law in that issue. That's what it means. And salvation is only through the Creator and the Redeemer, and that's Jesus Christ, who created all things by Jesus Christ. John 16, 8 says, And when He comes... He will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Now the Protestant world long ago through Robert Schuller said there's nothing worse than speaking about people's sin. We must forget about it. So he's saying that the work of the Holy Spirit is not important. It's a very strange doctrine indeed. Sin, righteousness and judgment. The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You cannot remember anything if you don't read the Word. He won't pour information and lead you apart from his Word. He will always work through the Word. And we, Acts 5.32 are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. So obedience is a criterion. Now let's, let's look at the charismatic movement in that sense. This movement fames itself in speaking in tongues. The definition of speaking in tongues we find in Acts chapter 2 where they spoke in their mother tongue, 17 languages listed, and they received the gift of communicating the gospel in different languages, and the Gentiles received this gift as they did. Today, we have the manifestation of a gift where the mind is excluded and a feeling and a nonsensical utterance is expressed. And I go back to this verse in Isaiah where it describes the function of the Spirit in Christ. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and the branch shall grow out of his roots, referring to Jesus. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. That's the function of the Holy Spirit. And if I go to Corinthians, where Paul addresses this issue in the Corinthian church, and you must remember that the Corinthians were not exactly exemplary at that stage, and 1 Corinthians is a rebuke to their doctrines, and it's written in an antithetical parallelism, 
This is what you do, but this is the right way. This is what you do, but this is the right way. And we go to 1 Corinthians 14, 14. It says, For I pr if I pray in an unknown tongue, unknown is not in the original. If I pray in a tongue and my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. That's what they were doing. Then he says, what is this then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with my understanding also. God will never bypass your cognitive function. Never. He didn't give you the gift of understanding. He didn't give you a gift of choice to bypass it. And when he was lifted up and he was dying on a cross, he did it because he honored your freedom of choice. So, if I pray, I will pray with the Spirit, but I'll pray with my understanding also. I'm not going to bypass my brain. And I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with my understanding also. I'm not going to sing brainless stuff that means nothing to me and puts me in a euphoric state. I want to know what I'm singing. I want to know what I'm doing. So beware of anything that is repetitive or chantive or based on syncopated rhythm or whatever. Never, ever allow the mind to be bypassed. Music must be worshipful. Music must be melodious. It must be harmonious. That cuts out a whole spectrum of things. That cuts out all rock music, all heavy metal, all rap, because it's none of those things. And it's harmony that's the intelligent side of music. And therefore, it must be incorporated in worshipful music. And it must be something that you can use your mind and apply your mind to. It mustn't be repetitive, garbled information. So now let's have a look at this in connection with the Catholic charismatic movement where Tony Palmer said that being an evangelical and being invited into this movement, he found no difference because the manifestations were identical. And based on the manifestations which were identical, he assumed that they were perfectly in order with God. But then he should have gone a step further and he said you find the same manifestation in Hinduism, you find the same manifestations in shamanism, you find the same manifestations in voodooism. Are they all acceptable? The Second Vatican Council and the Charismatic Renewal on the 25th of January 1959, only two months after his election as Pope, John the 23rd surprised the world with announcing this great Second Vatican Council. And what was it about? The possibility to contribute more efficaciously to the solution of the problems of the modern world. The joyful echo brought about by its announcement as well as the lively interest on part of non-Catholics and even non-Christians proved in the most eloquent manner the historical importance of the event which has not escaped anyone. So now he's been canonized because of this work. He's such an important work, bringing them all together again, that he is now a saint. Vatican II and the Charismatic View Movement. Cardinal Joseph Sunens, Templeton Prize winner, also a Mason, initiated on June 15, 1967, chosen by Pope John XXIII to be one of the chief architects of Vatican II meetings, served on all four committees, states, Since I've had this charismatic experience, my allegiance to the Holy Father as the Vicar of Christ, uh, excuse me, what's the function of the Holy Spirit? To lead to whom? To Christ. Not the Vicar of Christ. To Christ. Has been heightened and strengthened. My appreciation for Mary as the co-redemptress and mediatoress of my salvation has been assured. Uh, the Bible says there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. 
we have an advocate with the Father, the man Christ, Jesus. Now we have Mary here. Now if the function of the Holy Spirit is to lead to Christ, but he is experiencing Mary as his mediator and advocate has been increased, is it the Holy Spirit or is it another spirit? It must be another spirit. My appreciation of the Mass as the sacrifice of Christ has now been heightened. The Bible says, by one sacrifice he has forever made perfect. Here you have another sacrifice. Uh, is the sacrifice of Christ insufficient so that you would have a repetitive sacrifice here in the form of the Mass? Now if the Holy Spirit leads to truth, which is the Word, then what is this? This must be another spirit. And this is the charismatic movement of the Roman Catholic Church. Vatican II says about the charisms, it is not only through the sacraments and church ministries that the Holy Spirit sanctifies and leads the people of God. Excuse me. Where in the Bible does it tell you that you have to perform a particular ritual in order to be sanctified like a sacrament? Nowhere. So here's another spirit giving you another path, whereas the Bible says there's no other way except through Christ Jesus. Here is a works-based criterion. Okay. He distributes special graces amongst the faithful of every rank. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. I quote the Bible. These charismatic gifts, whether they be the most outstanding or the more simple and widely diffused, are to be received with thanksgiving and consolation, for they are exceedingly suitable and useful for the needs of the church. What does the Holy Spirit do again? He leads you to the Word. He leads you to Jesus. He leads you to obedience to the commandments. But here, he satisfies the needs of the church and not the sole needs of the seeker for truth. John Paul II and the charismatic renewal, while speaking to a half a million of Pentecostal Catholics, he said, Open yourselves docilely to the gifts of the Spirit, Accept gratefully and obediently the charisms which the Spirit never ceases to bestow on us. All right? Is that biblical? Doesn't the Bible say test the spirits? This one says, no, whatever the Spirit's going to give you, accept it docilely. Don't question it. Just take it. It's not biblical. And then he prayed, come Holy Spirit, come and renew the face of the earth. Who is he addressing? He's addressing the Holy Spirit. Come with your seven gifts. Come Spirit of life, Spirit of communion and love. The church and the world need you. Come Holy Spirit, make ever more fruitful the charisms you have bestowed on us. Give new strength and missionary zeal to these sons and daughters of yours who have gathered here, open their hearts, renew their Christian commitment to the world, make them courageous messengers of the gospel, witnesses to the risen Jesus Christ. There are some nice words in there. The Redeemer and Savior of man, strengthen their love and their fidelity to the church. And then he stated boldly, the movements are the hope of the church. And Ratzinger said the same thing. And then in 2006, Benedict was present at this vigil of Pentecost. The unknown God. Excuse me, didn't the Bible, Bible say the only ones who don't know him are whom? The world. But the ones who do know him are the people of God. Isn't that correct? So the Holy Spirit should never be an unknown God. The Holy Spirit considered until a few years ago as the unknown God. By whom? So are they, are they admitting that they never knew him? Is the one who with his grace tirelessly changes the lives of thousands of people in all corners of the world, who with renewed joy through the experience of the baptism in the Spirit, 
begin a new life lived precisely in the Holy Spirit. He is the one we wish to honor and glorify publicly. When he comes, he will not speak of himself. He will glorify Jesus. Here is another, here's another spirit. He's being addressed directly and he is the one they wish to glorify publicly. Now, this is really phenomenal. You see, the Bible says nobody comes to the Father except by Jesus. So the devil doesn't mind if the new Israel movement in the world negates Jesus and it comes to the Father directly. That's fine. I mean, the other religions too do that. Don't the Jews do it? Don't they go directly to the Father because they negate the Son? That's fine. And now we have another movement which goes directly to the Spirit. Who again is being sidelined? Jesus. And they are knocking on two doors, Father door, Spirit door, but there's only one door that gives access to both. And that's Jesus. And if you want to know what the Father is like, you have to look at Jesus. If you want to understand the character of the Godhead, you have to go through Jesus. You have to understand Jesus. So this is a new religion. So this is the one we wish to honor, glorify publicly, responding to the appeal that both John Paul II as well as Benedict made to the Catholic charismatic renewal and the whole church to spread the culture of Pentecost, the action of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church and in each of the faithful, the director added. This celebration, which will include moments of prayer, now you must listen to this carefully, this is the Catholic speaking, listening, Witnessing an invocation of the Spirit will end with the celebration of prayer, a music concert and a dance which will be presented as prayer by artists of different countries and all to give glory to the Holy Spirit and to thank Him for all He does every day in our lives. And Tony Palmer said that the manifestations there we're exactly the same as in the evangelical world, so there's no reason why we cannot become one. No reason. And the pontifical household preacher, Father Tom Forrest, one of the initiators of the charismatic experience, will speak on grace and the power of the Holy Spirit during the celebration in Marina. So the glue is at work, but the glue, according to the definition of the Bible, is not from God. It cannot be because it does the opposite work of that which is described in the Word. So the next step would be to unite the entire world, religious systems. If we can unite the Christian system, then all we have to do is unite the Christian system with all the other systems of the world, and then the entire world will have negated Jesus Christ. The entire world. So Pope calls for all religions to unite. And he made this call in March 21, on March 21, 2013. He urged members of all religions and those belonging to no church to unite to defend justice, peace and the environment there's no gospel there. And not allow the value of a person to be reduced to what he produces and what he consumes. All right, so he's talking to Orthodox, Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and asking them to unite. And just a brief while after that public announcement that all the world's religions must unite, 18 September 2014, 
The World Alliance of Religions for Peace Summit was held in Seoul, Korea. We are one. Fascinating. A massive stadium filled with thousands of people celebrating the unity of religion. And here is the signing ceremony in Seoul, Korea. Politicians of the world were there to sign an agreement for world peace and the religious leaders of the world. Now what is fascinating, when we look at this little video clip, we'll see that the Catholic Church is there, all the pagan religions are there, the Anglican is there, but there's no representative other than the Anglicans of the individual Protestant churches. Let's look at it. Peace will not be achieved without our every effort. Peace will be reached when everybody makes it their duty to become a messenger of peace for their nation and their societies. Today, we are not only here in our professional capacities, but as those who carry the heart of a peace advocate within us. World peace, we the youth believe, can only be achieved when all aspects, when all people come together as one. And in the past three days, you have seen that the youth, we have done all we can within our capacity. But we are looking upon the leaders right now, the leaders of the international community, the politicians, the lawmakers, and the religious leaders to help us fulfill this goal. Signing this agreement, it may not bring peace immediately, ladies and gentlemen, but what I'd like to say is that it is a step in the right direction, and the youth need your help. So now, we will we'll proceed with the signing ceremony of the Unity of Religion Agreement. The Unity of Religion Agreement is a groundbreaking promise of religions to unite condition unconditionally and without discrimination to achieve true peace. I would like to call upon the following religious leaders to come up to the stage and join us for the signing of the Ceremony of the Unity of Religions Agreement. First, Archbishop Martin de Jesus Barahona to please come up to the stage. Also, a representative of Holiness Sharukirti Panditak Hariyavari Aswam Swati Sri Bataraka to come to the stage. Also, from the Islam Shia faith, El Sharif Muhammad Hassan El Almini to come to the stage. From the Hinduism faith, His Holiness Swami Shidadanda Saraswatiji Maharaj, the Guru of India. From the faith of Buddhism, Representative Dr. Ashin Nyanisara, founder of the Sitaku Buddha Vihara. Would you please make your way to the stage? From the Catholic Church, Archbishop Antonio Ledesma from the Philippines. From the Anglican Church, Archbishop Patricio Enlique Viveros Robles. From the Sheikh religion, Singh Sahib Jana Gurbacha and Singhji. If you could make your, way, make your way to the stage, please. From the Jewish faith, Rabbi Jeremy Yehuda Milgrom. From the Zoroaster faith, Dr. Meher Master Moose. And from the Baha'i faith, Dr. Bharati Gandhi. At this time, we would also like to call upon the host of the World Alliance of Religions Peace Summit. Firstly, Mr. Man He Lee 
the chairman of HWPL, and also Ms. Nam Hee Kim, the president of IWPG. Let's give them a great applause. Uh, while the proceedings continue on stage, uh, we will conduct the signing ceremony of the agreement to propose the enactment of an international law for the cessation of war and world peace just below stage with our delegations and to establish peace for the heritage of peace to be brought to all generations. We must do everything in our power to end all wars on this earth and to establish world peace according to the will of the Creator, God. Therefore, all religions must unite under God as one. We pledge in sight of God, all people of the world, and the peace advocate to become under God through the unity of religion. We hereby acknowledge that we must be recreated through God's seed so that we might be recognized as the family of God. And in that likeness, shine an eternal light upon the earth, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We recognize our need for repentance, as well as our need to show grace to all the people of the world. Grace which can be seen in the light, rain and the air of heaven. And through that grace, lead humanity to salvation from death. That is quite phenomenal. That last sentence was pantheism in its fullness. And the Bible says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, you shall have no other gods beside me. By affixing that signature to that document, who has been written out of the Constitution? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has been written out of the Constitution for the sake of world peace. And in 2017, at the Jubilee of Jubilees, the Protestant world will perhaps officially apologize for the Reformation and join the unity of religion to say we have no other king save Caesar. Ezekiel 7.25, destruction cometh and they seek peace and there shall be none. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. May the Lord grant us wisdom. I am not saying the end of the world is in 2017, lest I be misconstrued. What I am saying is the cards are on the table. To repeat history as the Jewish nation did when they rejected Jesus Christ and crucified him. And they thought they were doing it for peace and they got sudden destruction. And the same will happen when the Christian world signs away their allegiance to no other God than the one who created and redeemed them. They will have followed in the footsteps of the Pharisees and the scribes and the people of Israel together with the Romans in the times of Jesus. And I believe that we as a people, must be prepared for what is coming upon the world because our message is diametrically opposed to this message. May God help us. Amen. Amen.